good morning, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Elliot Callen, president of the Prosperity Financial Group, and I'd like to welcome you to another episode of Meet the Expert. Today is very exciting and very informative. We have Andrew Hull on today. He is an ETF, an exchange traded or electronically traded fund strategist with First Trust out of Chicago. And he's got a really unique topic today, and that is disruptive technology in the clean energy space. Now we know that clean energy is just going after the oil and gas industry and the coal industry too. In many ways, the clean energy industry is also going after the clean energy industry. So this is very exciting what we're gonna talk about. I know most people don't know much about clean energy other than a wind farm or solar panels or solar on our house and getting a tax credit. But on a massive scale, it's in the billions and billions of dollars. So. Andrew, let me welcome you to Meet the Expert. Thanks for having me on. Appreciate it. Thanks for being here. So I'm going to turn the show over to you, and I'm going to have you go through your presentation for everyone here. Keep in mind that our audience is very diversified and very varied, and knowledge is very varied. So we ask you to make it in terms that everyone can understand, because we all understand solar energy and maybe wind tunnels, but we don't understand the money and the industry behind it. Uh, and then when we're all done, let's come on back. And people will be sending me their questions, and I'll I'll have a handful of questions for you. Okay. All right. Sounds great. All well, right. uh, yeah, this is a great uh, this is a great topic. I think it's it's uh, very relevant today. It's a, on a lot of uh, investors' minds. And um, in my role as a strategist at First Trust, uh, one of the areas I get to focus on is these very narrow investment themes, um, which sort of are sort of these narrow industries that, that are experiencing long-term secular growth. And a lot of these are in um, new technology, disruptive innovations, and uh, many of them are related to, to digital connectivity, but um, it, these kind of enabling platforms. But one of them that is uh, uh, really taken off over the last 12 to 18 months is, is the renewable energy industry. So um, it's very much a disruptive technology, like some of the other themes we talk about, like cloud computing or biotechnology, cybersecurity, those types of themes. Um, so, yeah, what I'd like to do um, is just kind of go through the theme in general, kind of give the investment thesis, and then, uh, yeah, I'll be happy to, to answer any questions. So I do have a few slides, so uh, let me jump over to those really briefly. And uh, I think the first thing to, to really talk about with, with the renewable energy theme is kind of where we've been looking back over the last 15 years or so. Um, and as you can see, this is uh, uh, an industry that has experienced trem a tremendous amount of investment. So uh, last year, $282 billion was invested in green and renewable energy. Uh, that's in 2019, the latest data available. But cumulatively, if you look over the last 15 years, you can see it's, it's multi-trillions of dollars that have been invested here. And um, again, you can see more recently uh, with the bars there on the chart, you can see uh, the, the yellow is, is solar investment. Uh, and then the light blue is, is the wind energy uh, industry. And you can see that's where the, the majority of the investment is going, biofuels and biomass a little bit less. Um, you can see it was it's larger back in 2006 and 2007 than it is today. Um, but and this is a very much a global theme. And even here in the U.S., um, we're seeing tens of billions of dollars being invested in this. And we have for the last few years, $56 billion uh, was, was uh, invested in the U.S. in re the renewable energy industry. And that's, you know, if you look at the last uh, bar there, that takes up uh, over a quarter of the world total. Um, so that was even higher than China and Europe. So this is, uh, you know, while we think about wind energy, we often think of Europe um, or, or solar technology. We think of China, maybe. This is very much a theme that is relevant here in the U.S. and is um, really taking off as far as uh, um, investment is concerned. So that's kind of the past, kind of where we've been over the last 15 years or so. Um, but let's kind of jump forward. You know, as vet investors, we're always trying to look to the future, trying to um, anticipate where the market is going to be and, and where investment is going to go. So um, what I talk about kind of a, maybe a short-term driver and then sort of the main primary long-term driver in the theme going forward. 
And the first one is, is in the short term, um, what we're seeing is a huge push, uh, a public policy tailwind, if you will, uh, around the world for this industry. So uh, we call this sort of the green coronavirus response to the COVID-19 pandemic of, of last year and, and currently now in 2021 as well. Um, so kind of in an effort to, to stimulate economic activity, governments around the world have been spending trillions and trillions of dollars through fiscal policy and um, you know, few industries really have benefited more than the renewable energy industry has in, in that sense, as far as when you look at the stimulus dollars. Um, you know, so we look at this kind of as a, as a tailwind for the industry, especially this year. Uh, and let me give you kind of some examples on just how big the market is for, uh, has been for this stimulus and, and this fiscal dollars going to the renewable energy industry. Uh, earlier last summer, the European Union, they passed their long-term budget. They passed their fiscal stimulus package. 500 billion euros just in that one package um, went towards green initiatives. Just a, a staggering amount. And that went for things like solar and, and wind projects, um, electric vehicles and, and uh, public transportation, things like that. Um, so that was at an EU level, but then individual European countries like Germany, France, Denmark, uh, the UK, they all had uh, tens of billions of their, of their own dollars uh, that they committed to, to green causes as well. Uh, even beyond Europe, China, uh, they've, they sort of have a different economy, obviously kind of a command and a con control economy, um, but they're even talking about uh, um, more investment in, in renewable sources of energy, um, and, and they're looking at potentially bringing forward some of their mandates, 20% uh, of their electricity from renewable power in the next 10 years. So um, it doesn't sound like a lot, but that's, uh, again, to get there, that's tens of, of billions, if not trillions of dollars in investment uh, to get there. So here in the U.S., obviously, um, in 2021, we're recording this now. Uh, we know the outcome of the election. We know the, the White House, both houses of Congress went to the Democratic Party. And I think we all know that, um, you know, climate change and, and green uh, renewable power and electricity is high on the priority list for the Democratic Party. So there's a lot of, um, you know, uh, uncertainty about potentially more stimulus and what that's going to look like. But we think if, you know, there is another round of, of infrastructure spending that this industry is likely to be a, a large beneficiary. Um, we know that that candidate Joe Biden last summer, he came out with a $2 trillion climate, climate plan is what he called it. Um, it remains to be seen what, what that's gonna look like now that uh, he's the president, but uh, we all know that he's, he's absolutely uh, in favor of um, reduced emissions and, and things like that. So we think given the, the political tailwinds, the results of the election, as well as this uh, um, collision of coronavirus stimulus response and green energy. We think uh, over the short term, over the next year, a few years, the, the outlook is very bright for this industry. But sort of beyond that, I think um, that's kind of where um, maybe what's driven a lot of the outperformance in this sector over the last uh, 12 months, six months, things like that. But if you look longer term, I think what's maybe even more important is, than that is, is what I have on the screen here. And, and this, is, this is really the foundation. This is what um, really we think is going to drive the renewable energy industry forward in the next five to 10 years. And that is simply the economics behind it. So if you look at the, the chart on the left, you can see that the cost of solar and wind technology has fallen dramatically. And this is just over the last six to seven years. In fact, it's fallen so dramatically that it's actually economically competitive with traditional sources of fuel like coal and natural gas. On the right, you can see just how much these technologies have dropped. Um, you can see uh, solar on the left has fallen about 82% over the last decade. Uh, concentrating solar power, these are your solar farms, that technology and the power that's generated from those, uh, those farms has fallen 47%. And then of course, on and offshore wind fallen 30 to 40% over the last 10 years. So this is huge. Um, this is absolutely a game changer. And, and this is uh, an industry that has now reached a tipping point to where it, it can stand on its own two feet. Uh, these are these are technologies that are, are competitive, like I mentioned, with with traditional sources of energy. Um, but but the bottom line is they don't need government subsidies. They don't need uh, physical 
uh, stimulus and tax incentives and things like that to really stand on their own anymore. Uh, they're very much competitive uh, over the long term. And one 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 that's uh, technology that's not on this chart is is uh, lithium ion batteries. Uh, battery costs. Uh, per kilowatt hour have dropped almost 90% over the last 10 years. So uh, when we talk about electric vehicles, that's, that's part of this uh, transition to new sources of energy and uh, battery technology, the cost of those batteries has fallen uh, just like some of these other technologies. So we think this is really the bedrock for um, the adoption uh, and the rate of growth in this space to continue like it is. So this chart here just shows um, kind of where we are and give some context. So this is uh, the world share of global electricity generation. And you can see we're just under 10% last year of electricity generated worldwide is from wind and solar. Um, but if you look, you know, it might not sound like that much, but just five years ago, we were about half of what we were today uh, last year. And uh, wind and solar jet power generation increased actually 14% in 2020 compared to the prior year. So um, it's huge growth, even though it's still um, very much a minority as far as uh, where we're getting our electricity globally. Um, obviously, coal is still dominant, but you can see these are technologies that are eating away at market share every year, every month um, going forward. We're in that sort of rapid growth phase for a lot of these renewable energy technologies. Um, so this is the world. Uh, the question is, okay, what does that kind of look like here in the U.S.? And I think this is a really fascinating chart. This is this is from the uh, EIA, um, the uh, basically the government sort of statistical uh, department within the Department of Energy. And what they show is that in 2019, um, coal actually dropped below. This is energy consumption. So Americans actually consumed more electricity. Uh, from renewable sources in 2019. Uh, and this is going back 70 years. So you can see that this is absolutely uh, something that's almost unprecedented, you could say. Um, and and just, to, just to explain a little bit, the black line there is coal, obviously, declining pretty dramatically, and then renewables, uh, the green line, increasing as well. So, uh, and what's interesting about this, too, is that President Trump was uh, was uh, a very much an outspoken supporter of the coal industry. And yet, despite that, um, the economics really drove uh, renewables to be uh, take up more of a share of, of electricity generation and electricity consumption than coal did. So um, again, that kind of goes to show that this is a technology, this is um, an innovation that uh, it's sort of like a, a, a boulder or a snowball rolling downhill. Now that the economics are working in its favor, it's just picking up more and more steam. And we expect these, the trend here to, uh, to continue um, going forward, kind of regardless of what the uh, political, uh, who's in office um, and, and um, what the public policy tailwind is. Long term, we think these trends are, are going to continue. So um, bottom line, I, I think just kind of wrapping it up here, we think this energy transition is, is well underway uh, worldwide, but even here in the U.S. And so um, whether you're looking at wind and solar or you're looking at advanced battery technology, all of it, we think, is uh, it's, it's just a matter of time before it becomes uh, potentially the majority of where we get our electricity and, and how our cars are, are fueled. So um, bottom line, you know, for investors, we think this is very much a, a bright space. We think there's a lot of growth ahead. Um, certainly, there's there's been a lot of that growth that's been uh, priced into some of the, the names that are um, – you know, innovators and, and really large in this space, but we think there's going to be continued uh, growth and a tremendous opportunity ahead. Uh, so with that, I'll, I'll stop and turn it back over to you, Elliot, if there's any questions. Thanks, Andrew. Well, I have a few questions. Uh, some of our uh, clients are interested, a few other ideas. And so does the solar, I have maybe five questions here. Let me start with the geopolitical question, then I get to the energy specific question, if that's okay with you. Sure. And that is with, with many of these new technologies, solar, even the batteries. Um, we'll take the name Tesla out of this conversation since that's now the 800 pound gorilla in batteries. But the minerals come from China and we are at some form of economic war with China right now. So how does that play out on the, the, the chain of supply, the supply chain in this, in this industry? Yeah. 
Yeah, that's that is uh, very much a, a thing that's uh, top of mind for a lot of uh, investors, a lot of people looking at the industry. Um, and I think, I think um, you know, in the long term, I think it's in both both parties' interests, right? It's in the in- interest of the U.S. It's the interest of uh, the Chinese to work together um, to come up with a, a solution to this. I know. Uh, domestically, they're they're trying to ramp up a lot of the the mining for silicon and, and lithium in places like Nevada, I believe, and, and some of the western uh, other western states in the U.S. Uh, so there's definitely a push domestically to try to get more uh, access to those those minerals and, and those critical inputs for advanced batteries. Um, but you know, I would say there is I agree with you, kind of a cold war between the U.S. and China economically. Um, but I think. Um, you know, there's there's such huge opportunity and such huge advantage to working together that I think uh, ultimately I think you know both countries are going to be able to figure something out and and uh, see if we can get that lithium out of the ground and, and continue to advance this uh, energy transition. Okay, let me talk to you for a moment about tax credits and how they fund the industry. Um, and I do want to end with the fact that you have a product that's in several of our portfolios. So. If clients are asking, how do I invest in this industry? How do I take advantage of it? Give us a call because we've now added clean energy to portfolios and we're using the first trust product. So that's a little plug for what you folks are doing there. But, Mm -hmm. you know, is there a solar energy without solar credits? And really what what Tesla has done a great job, Elon Musk has done a world-class job doing is understanding the tax code because he's losing money on every vehicle he sells but he's making money because of the tax code. And so is there, if there's no real profitability outside the tax code, is this really a viable future? Yeah, that is one criticism of, of, of the industry in general is that it, it relies on these government subsidies and, and tax credits and things like that. Um, and I think that's, that's been true, um, certainly prior in, in this decade and um, you know, I don't want to get too far into the weeds on individual companies or anything, but um, I, I think this is a, a technology, like I mentioned with the a slide earlier, that um, it, it is able to stand on its own two feet. And this is, um, this is from a number of different independent sources that are looking at the cost of these new technologies and the cost of the energy they produce. And um, what they're saying is that even without these subsidies, so in general, um, you know, taking Tesla or any individual names uh, out of the discussion for a moment. I think, I think these are technologies that are truly able to stand on their own two feet. You know, I, I don't think that's something that could have been said not that long ago, uh, just a few years ago, where they absolutely had to rely on uh, incentives and, and tax credits and things like that. Um, a lot of cases, those tax credits and incentives are still in place. And so that's going to be a, an additional driver Um even though the the economics, the foundation, the bedrock behind these technologies, uh, they're competitive on their own. They have that additional tailwind now of uh, uh, um, those, those tax credits, their sort of legacy tax credits and things that are still in place. So um, I, I would say it's it's uh, an interesting debate, but I think you know for investors looking forward, it's all going to be tailwinds for rapid adoption and, and further growth in the industry. Okay. And you think, is there a technology coming down the road for solar that we think um, is smaller? It miniaturizes it. It takes the semiconductor industry and applies it to the solar industry, mean, meaning it miniaturizes it. So today's panel is, let's say, four feet by six feet. Uh, is there a time I'm going to see a solar panel on my car that's one inch by one inch? Yeah, that's a good question. I'm not sure if I have a, a great answer for that, but um, we've seen r- rapid growth in, in everything from uh, the semiconductor industry to um, just how efficient these are, especially, you know, semiconductors are, like you mentioned, are, are absolutely critical for getting this uh, the, this flow of uh, electricity, you know, if you're generating it on your car or your house or whatever it may be, uh, getting that back into the grid and doing it efficiently. And um, they're absolutely critical for that. And so, um, I think, uh, I, I don't know if I have a great answer for you on that one, but I think we're going to see, um, you know, this is a, an industry that is seeing a, a ton of investment, like I, I previously showed, you know, tens, if not hundreds of billions of dollars in investment. And so I think we're going to continue to see a, a massive amount of innovation. And um, I wouldn't rule out anything like that, certainly in the future. 
<laughs> All right, well, two more quick questions, Andrew, and I really appreciate your time. Um, and that is, the first question is about the lithium battery. Is I know the lithium battery is here right now, but is the lithium battery gone tomorrow? Is What's the next technology beyond the lithium battery? Yeah, I think, I think right now it, it seems like um, the lithium battery, I mean, it's been around for a long time, uh, you know, decades. And so uh, right now, it seems like most of the development is, is continuing on with, with the lithium battery, making it more efficient, you know, changing the design of it. Um, you know, we, some of us probably watched the Tesla battery day a few months ago and, and just all the innovation going on within the lithium battery um, space. And so I think um, it, it's, a, it's a form factor. It, it's a technology that can um, still be uh, innovated, uh, still, you know, design changes and tweaks and things like that. I don't think we're anywhere near a point where we've gotten all we can out of the lithium battery. So I wouldn't say it's, it's going anywhere anytime soon. And in fact, uh, it's, being, it's being adopted in a lot of places uh, like wind and solar farms. Uh, some of the, the mega packs and things like that, uh, these batteries are being rolled out, uh, you know, right alongside or right in the middle of a wind farm. Um, to be able to capture that energy and store it. Uh, that was always kind of the issue with, with wind technology and solar technology was there no way to store the energy for when the, the wind didn't blow and the sun wasn't out. Um, but now with these uh, advanced batteries, they're able to capture that when it is windy and keep, it, keep that energy, store it, and, and utilize it uh, when, it's, when it's not windy. So I think uh, the, sky's, the sky's the limit in a lot of senses for, uh, for battery technology. Okay, and last question, Andrew, and that is about hydrogen power. The idea that and I know there's a European car maker that has a pickup truck that basically it, it uses some type of power to split the atom or split the, not the atoms, to split the molecules of H, hydrogen and oxygen. And it takes the hydrogen and it powers, let's assume, let's say your car, your truck, it powers that and it converts the balance of it to water. And so you're basically making fresh water and the only thing coming out of your exhaust pipe is water vapor. So what's the future of hydrogen power? Yeah, hydrogen um, is an interesting one. It doesn't have quite the investment that uh, battery packs lithium ion does right now. And I think it still has the technology has some detractors. Some people say uh, it's not the future. It's not going to work. It's too unstable as a fuel source compared to lithium ion. Um, but it remains to be seen. You know, I, I'm not a, I'm not an engineer. I'm not an expert as far as exactly how it works and, and the, the, the best way to make it safe and, and feasible for everybody to use. Um, it is certainly a, a very uh, inexpensive source of, of power. And, um, you know, there's there's a number of companies that uh, that we've looked at and, and that we implement in our portfolios that, uh, that are developing some uh, potential solutions in that space. So um, it, it remains to be seen. I, I'm not sure um, I think right now, I think um, lithium ion batteries are, are you know, being adopted and, and that's kind of where a lot of the push is from an investment standpoint. Well, great. This has been really informative. And again, if you're interested as an investor, as a consumer in finding more about this and how to invest in this market and just understand this, give us a call. We'll go over it. We've added it to our portfolios uh, and we could have that conversation to see if it fits with your risk profile and you fully understand what you're investing in. So we've been talking with Andrew Hull. He's an uh, ETF strategist with First Trust, disruptive technologies, clean technology. Andrew, thank you for being part of this today. And Thanks, Elliot. Great to speak with you. Have a great day, everybody.